Chaos at Columbia, the university president telling the New York Police Department to start removing demonstrators camping out on campus. They describe themselves as pro-Palestinian, some even chanting this. Now that chant right there, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, is interpreted, is interpreted as a call for Israel's extinction. One protester on the New York streets could even be heard making this claim. Yes, we're all Hamas, Remember how this escalated just yesterday? Columbia University's president testified up on Capitol Hill about anti-Semitism. Americans testifying before Congress is absolutely nothing new. Happens all the time in Capitol Committee rooms here in D.C., but it triggered protests. The university president says the encamped students have been suspended. So here's what we'll ask in moments. Should that be the end, or is this defensible? Here's what Google did to 28 of its workers, by the way, who forced a police response at their office. They're now fired. Come on in. I'm Blake Berman. This is The Hill on News Nation. All right, here we are, here we go, hanging out with us today, Mick Mulvaney, former Trump White House Chief of Staff, News Nation contributor as well. Jonay Wartell is a former senior advisor in the Georgia Senate runoff election. Max Rose, former Democratic congressman from the state of New York. And Denise Gitsum, former aide to George W. Bush, News Nation contributor as well. Hello to you all. Nice to have you in. Two major stories in New York today. <laughs> we pulled you out of your hometown. Yep. Uh, Donald Trump, we'll get to that in a second with the, the jury officially being chosen there. But Mick, uh, Columbia University, you spoke there recently, I think a couple of months ago, yeah, give I, or take. I, I, what, what's the right response? Yeah, I, I spoke there and I was very well received, to make things perfectly clear. Okay. Uh, the, the right response is to allow them to protest until they start interrupting something else. They interfere with somebody else. We talked about this mm -hmm. on the show a little bit last night, okay? Protest, great. It's what students have done in this country forever. They start blocking roads. They start blocking bridges. They start assaulting people. Um, that's a different story. So I, I don't know what's happening on the ground in Columbia, in, in New York, but clearly the president of the university thought that this was getting out of hand. Agree with that? Yeah, I mean, that's a basic, you know, statement of constitutional rights here. But what I think is interesting is how everyone is forgetting that Hamas is a foreign terrorist organization. And it, when it comes to FTOs, and there's only about 60 of them, our constitutional rights actually fundamentally change. You are not allowed to provide material support to a foreign terrorist organization. Now, that does, you can exercise your free speech rights, but you can't materially support them in a manner that's recruitment or anything that actually actively helps them. People have gone to jail for this for decades. And when it comes to many of these protesters, I am certain that they are not tracking this. And the, at times, it does seem that they are that they are flirting. So, with it. so ha Hamas, uh, named by the State Department, October 1997. So we're talking 26, 27 yeah. years ago that it was labeled, as you rightly point out, a foreign terrorist organization. So when you hear someone there on the street say, "We are Hamas," now, granted, she doesn't speak for everyone. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, she's, they, allowed, she's allowed. She's allowed to say, say that. that. She, yeah. she is allowed to say that. But the the issue here, though is that I'm not certain she understands, or maybe she does, the line that she is abutting against. Mm -hmm. After 9-11, I'm certain that even if people felt some weird sense of sympathy to those overseas who had attacked us, they would have understood that it was illegal to align yourself with Al-Qaeda in a fundamental and substantive manner. There, is no, there are no tiers on the FTO list. Right. Uh, you, you're you know, either on it or you're you, not. You are either on it or you are not. Right. And Hamas is a foreign terrorist organization, and we have to, and it is their responsibility, I believe, to start to separate what is a legitimate discussion about the future of the region and relationships between Palestine and Israel and Hamas, which is a terrorist but organization. But Max, that's a law enforcement thing, and I get that. I agree with everything you said. It's right, okay? 
But the university is the one to shut this down, not law enforcement. So clearly they were doing something that violated the university rules. Not The university would never arrest somebody for supporting Hamas. That's what law enforcement does. They probably did something on campus, interfering with people's ability to get to school, closing buildings, sure. that type of stuff. So it's a the university shut this down, yeah. not the government. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't really want us to get into a society where we are all existing in safe zones, right? And, <laughs> you know, if you shut down this or you shut down that, there used to be a day where where that would actually grab someone's attention. I say that as someone who's an avowed supporter of Israel. So we can't swing to the other end of the spectrum here where, for, where we don't have dynamic circumstances. But this is the last thing I'll say on this. Columbia University does have a legal responsibility, and it's probably in their codes too, to not allow their stu- their students to express avowed support for a foreign terrorist organization. Live look at Columbia University, by the way, uh, Denise. I mean, I, I think of how universities bend over backwards to accommodate the sensitivities of everyone except for the Jewish student population right now. That's what it feels like is finally there's a university president that's stepping up and saying, hey, you know, put yourselves in the shoes of those poor students. There was, uh, I think, 3,200 anti-Semitic acts that occurred in the three months after October 7th. And to think that this is just an expression without consequence to people Students who have to walk through the quad and go to class, and they're supposed to be able to focus on their studies and be a productive person and, and embrace them part of the community. I, I, it, it boggles my mind that in these institutions that claim to be for everybody, they're for everyone jo- but Jonah, select did, few. Did, did Columbia, Columbia and Google got this right? Well, I think two different, two, two different, two different. I know, but two, they both get it right. You have to look at the context for each, right? You have to understand that Columbia University has a responsibility to protect their students, but they also have a responsibility to promote and foster free speech. And when you look at what these students were saying, whether it was what we wanted to hear them say or what we think was right to say, they have a right to express themselves. And so I think that it was important that the university protect these students' right to express themselves. However they felt about the speech is really irrelevant. But I do think they also have a responsibility to protect their students right. as an institution of higher learning. So I think that they they took actions that I think across the country we might find other universities taking and they'll be in the line of fire for it. All right. Elsewhere in New York today, uh, on the third day, we have a jury. That's what we learned. Twelve jurors, one alternate, have been selected for former President Donald Trump's hush money trial. Five more alternates are still needed. Judge Merchan expects to finish tomorrow, so you could potentially get opening arguments on Monday. But the former president is still, and you'll probably hear this every day, (laughs) complaining about being in court. It's a shame. It's a shame. And I'm sitting here for days now, from morning till night, in that freezing room. Freezing. Everybody was freezing in there. And all for this. Yeah. Isn't that something? All right, come on in. Jesse Weber, News Nation legal contributor, a Law and Crime Network host as well. Jesse, hello. Great to talk to you as always. So there's a, a jury 12 picked. I think they still need the alternates. This sets us up for Monday, right? Is, is that when we're going to hear opening arguments? Well, first, let me just say, I've been in that courthouse before, maybe even that courtroom. It is freezing in there. When I covered okay. the Harvey Weinstein trial, the windows were open. I get it. Now, yes, if they can get five more alternates tomorrow, which looks like they will because Donald Trump's side uh, has, they have no more preemptory challenges. That would be the ability to get rid of just jurors for whatever they, reason they want. It seems like they're going to get the five alternates rather quickly. We will have opening statements on Monday, which I think are some of the most important moments at a trial. You know, there's studies that say even though jurors are not supposed to, they make up their mind about a case after opening statements, after each side summarizes what this case is going to be about. So I will tell you, Monday could be one of the most important days in this week's long Hmm. trial. Okay. Um, We've heard the former president make uh, make his case, or at least start to, to ratchet up the criticism against the judge with this potential that he might not be able to attend his son's high school graduation, Jesse, and there are some on the right who are now pushing back on the idea saying, you know what, this doesn't sit right. What is what is the actual um, responsibility out of the judge here? And do you think that is going to be the eventual decision from this judge? I think it's very unfair for Donald Trump to criticize the judge on this hmm. pl- platform. Look, I think, okay. there, there, first of all, there's a New York, uh, New York law which suggests that the defendant, a criminal defendant, has to be in that courtroom. Are there accommodations made? Absolutely. You know, there's health issues. There's things like that. But this is a criminal trial. He's been indicted. He's facing felony charges. 
he has to be there. And although he says that he's being treated unfairly, there is another argument to say that as many times as he has allegedly violated the gag order and other certain, and by the way, as we talked about last time, the judge has actually ruled favorably to him on a number of occasions. Right. He's actually being treated, in my opinion, quite fairly, given the circumstances hmm. here. And, and look, criminal defendants across this country will say, it's not fair, I have to be there, I miss this, I miss that. You're on trial, and this is a very serious case. Even though we can criticize the prosecution here and what the evidence might be, he is facing these charges, and he, we're in the middle right now of the trial. Hey, Jesse, it's Mick Mulvaney. I don't want to get too much inside baseball, but sure. you've tried some cases. I've tried some cases. I was struck by the fact there were two lawyers, at least two lawyers, yeah. on this panel, the jury panel. Did that strike you as a little unusual? I, I don't think I've ever seen that. It, it's not common. And let me tell you the concern. Hmm. The concern is, is that the other jurors, if they find that out, will then right. turn to the, those jurors and say, let's listen huh. to what the lawyers have to say about this. You don't really want that. Now, How would they not find that out, Jesse? Yeah, like, they're I mean, going to be they, with each other for weeks. What did what, you do over the weekend? What do you do for a living? That seems like a fairly... And if they, know, if, they, if they don't find out during the course of the trial, right, if they don't find out during the course of the trial, sometimes lawyers, what can I say? We like to boast about it. They might boast about it during the actual deliberations. But here's another way of looking at it. A lawyer on the jury is not a bad thing. You're dealing with kind of nuanced hmm. legal issues, both from the prosecution and the defense. But even from Trump's point of view, if you're trying to say to that level, get to that level of criminal intent, Sometimes having a lawyer there that can break down the issues and kind of remove the emotion and be very analytical for it can be a good thing uh, for the jury one way or another. But having two lawyers, well, hopefully, I don't know if they'll be on the same side or not, but I'm sure the arguments will get quite of intense during uh, deliberations. All right, Jesse Weber, News Nation legal contributor. We'll catch you up probably tomorrow. It's not tomorrow. <laughs> Definitely next week. Every day after that. Jesse Weber, thank you so good much. You, Appreciate it. Um, of all the gripes I've heard Trump make, why complain about the temperature in the courtroom? That is, is this just like I don't he's going to pick about up in here? It, 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 well, it is cold right. in here. He right ran now. out of things to gripe about. I assume <laughs> <laughs> ran out of things to, to complain about. Right? I, I don't know. Um, maybe it's keeping him awake. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah, there's, right, there's yeah. Uh, reports that he's you know not so attentive at times. Uh, Monday, Trump uh, opening arguments. It sounds like we're we're going to get in mm -hmm. that case. What do you make of it? Well, first of all, I'll tell you who's not going to make any statements about this, and that is the Democratic Party. It has yep. been remarkable the degree to which the Democrats have stayed unified and disciplined in their effort to not talk about these cases. And the thinking is? Well, they don't do anything that isn't backed up by data at this point, and this is a political loser for the Democratic Party. That doesn't mean that it's not legally justified and the right okay. and moral thing to do, but certainly it is not a winner. That's why I believe there has been such a substantive Trump bump for the last two years in the polls, because it's just been these court cases over okay. and over and over again. All right. Still to come here from the Hill, over the next 45 minutes or so, the escalating clash between Israel and Iran. Israel is weighing a response after last week's attack. How far might it go? I'll talk with the retired four-star General Wesley Clark on the other side of the break. Plus, a good chunk of the Kennedy family endorsing President Biden today. But did Robert F. Kennedy Jr. actually one-up them? Where RFK Jr. is now on the ballot and how that could shake up the presidential race and take your kid to work day it's next week don't you know why the chairman though in one committee got in on the act a little earlier than that stay with us you're watching the hill here on news nation Welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. President Biden today announced new sanctions on Iran. They target that country's drone program, steel industry, and auto companies following Iran's we weekend drone attack on Israel. Now, you might notice one thing, though, not mentioned among the sanctions. Oil. In an interview earlier today, President Biden's top economic advisor, Lael Brainerd, was asked about the administration's response to rising gas prices. We're keeping a very close eye on um, gas prices at the pump and also, of course, um, some of the events in the Middle East. Um, there's geostrategic risk. We'll continue to very closely monitor, make sure that gas prices remain um, uh, affordable. Let me show you a headline here from the Financial Times. Iran oil exports hit six-year high as West prepares sanctions. So... Mick, the sanctions came out today. This is the bind that the administration is in, right? Yeah. If you don't go after the, if you go after the oil, 
gas prices get raised in an election year. Is yeah, that not what just, happens? You just saw the reason that Leo Brainerd doesn't come out to speak much for the, for the, <laughs> for the administration. That's, that's a really, really bad answer. How so? We're watching it closely. <laughs> Good, because so are consumers. That's not the right answer. What's the um, right answer? The right answer is we're going to do something about this, but, they, but they, the, the, they simply won't. This is a $35 billion a year number to the Iranian government, but they, the administration can't do anything about it because if they mm. do, inflation goes up and right. the chances of winning re-election right. go down. So it's pretty simple. Ar- Iranian, uh, they, they didn't go after the oil. There's a story in the Wall Street Journal. Let me show you that headline. U.S. says oil companies in Venezuela can still operate despite regime oppression. Biden administration says licenses will be evaluated on a case-by-case basis. They're not touching the oil mess. There's a deeper point here, though, that after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the United States Treasury Department announced that they were going to put crippling sanctions on Russia, um, on their entire economy and their most wealthy people, and their economy has grown since then. So we do also have to talk about in an era of cryptocurrency and deglobalization, what is the capacity and limits of our sanctions policy? And should that be the tool of national security that we turn to? Oh, my God. That, 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 there's a huge element here. But you can't, where you can't use the crypto to buy oil if you can't get the oil out of you the can, country. First of all, you can use crypto to buy if, just about everything, even, can, even a jacket as nice as yours. But the, <laughs> but the, or, or a haircut the, like yours. <laughs> but you can't do it if you can't get the oil out of the country. So, yeah, the Chinese can use crypto to buy Iranian oil, but if the Iranian oil can't ship out of Iran, then what difference does it make? Well, look, they, they were saying that Russian oil couldn't ship either, and they figured, well, that's out, a way, that's they, they figured out a way to do it. But the, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is that sanctions are centered around the idea that the dollar is the only currency that you can use for international transactions. That is no longer the case in many instances. And we have to come face to face with using other levers at our disposal when we want to punish yeah, nations that's right. rather than just announcing sanctions because they're not as effective as we are acting. Right? One of my favorite things in life is there are many currencies in life and money is only one of them. And I think this administration has made a lot of mistakes in treating Iran and and bad actors as though they were rational actors that we could eventually trust and perhaps diplomatize into playing nice. And what we've seen is, you know, within weeks of taking office, Biden removed the terrorist designation from the Houthis. And and then they also allowed U.N. sanctions against the Iranian missile and drone program to expire. And those are the very kinds of weapons that were used in this attack. So we have to decide, you know, this administration has to decide what are like, are we going to fight both sides of this war and try to treat them in two different ways as if this this proven bad actor has the ability to somehow come around and, and be a safe actor again? They're not. Were the actions that were taken today, Janae, and yesterday with Venezuela a result of foreign policy or or a result of the election? I'd say there was a little bit of both. I think that the um, Biden administration is is thinking about the campaign as well, right? They've got a lot of political calculus to understand the implications that this is going to have on prices. They understand the implications that this is going to have on the economy more broadly. And I think they're playing a little bit of chess and chess here because they understand that the the, the implications are far reaching, and you know this could really be a hot potato on the campaign trail. All right. Well, Iran is vowing to strike back if Israel does go ahead and retaliate for last week's uh, bombardment. The Iranian official in charge of nuclear security warns, quote, if any threat or action against its nuclear facilities is made by the Zionist regime, as they put it, referring to Israel, then Iran will review its nuclear doctrine and deviate from it. Joining us now is the retired Army General Wesley Clark, former NATO allied Supreme Commander as well. General, nice to see you as always. Great to have you back here on the Hill. Let's start with where we um, started this segment. The Biden administration today un- unveiling all of those sanctions against Iran. And there was one word missing in that press release, and it was oil. Why? They really can't, they tr- really can't stop the, the oil market from working. <clears throat> if they tried, uh, what you're going to have is a, is a really rampant sudden spike in inflation, and especially in gasoline prices in the United States. They know it. It's been the dilemma facing the Biden administration really the whole time. If you believe in renewable energy, you want to depress the uh, oil market and uh, and oil exploration and all that sort of thing. You can't. It's fundamental to the economy. Uh, Electric vehicles, uh, 
Sure, they're great, but uh, in Arkansas, we don't have any because we don't have any charging stations. People don't want them. All right. So, you know, it, it's just a, a fundamental issue, and it's not just oil. <clears throat> if you're going to really impose sanctions, you got to go after friendly countries, neutral countries. Yeah. That's, that's so that was on. my next question. What about China? Because they're, they're the ones con- buying and consuming a lot of this Iranian oil. Right. And not only that, they're selling chips and other things right into the Russian war machine. So the United States still has economic relations with China. We've got to figure out how to live with China. If China suddenly disappeared, you'd have a massive adverse impact in the U.S. economy. So uh, somehow we're, we've got to live together. That, that, that's the real limitation of sanctions. And I hate to say it. I, I know I'm just an old general. I'm going to say, you know, military force. No, still, you're not just that, they, sir. Um, <laughs> use. Um, let, let me let me leave you ask you this and, and leave you with this. Israel, its next move, what should it be as you see it? Well, I think Israel's got to respond. If they don't, they endorse uh, Iranian ability to cap the escalation. And Israel's security has always depended on their ability to dominate any regional power. Suddenly they can't. They're not going to. They've got to. Now, Bibi's a very cautious man. The generals are saying, go after them. The generals are saying, go after them right away. Don't even wait. Okay, Bibi's going to ha- harvest whatever diplomacy he can get, whatever condemnation of Iran. You think he's he being get. cautious right now? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cautious. But he's got, uh, Israel has to strike back. And I think they have to strike back with kinetic power into Iran to demonstrate the fact that they've got still escalation dominance. Now, I'm very concerned about these statements coming from the Iranians. They sound a lot like what uh, Putin said to the United States and NATO when he went into Ukraine. And we know that Iran is either has nuclear weapons or moving toward nuclear weapons. And we know we've got to find a way either live with that or, or get rid of them. And, you know, Israel has talked for 15 years about striking those nuclear weapons. The United States has already said no. But here we are right now at this point where they're right on the brink of having nuclear capability. They probably can't deliver it yet, but they've probably got some nuclear devices. Okay. And um, it's a problem, and it's a real dilemma for Israel. Mick Mulvaney wants to jump in here. I'll let Mick General, Mick Mulvaney, and you just said something that caught both my attention and Max, the former member of Congress here. Did you just say that, that either Iran is getting ready to have a nuclear weapon or already has one? Do, do that's we really right. think that's, that, that's a possibility? I do think that's a possibility. I'm, I'm not relaying any classified intelligence. I'm just saying okay, what, what is common sense and also what people inside Iran tell me. So this program's moved <laughs> forward. You know, the U.S. intelligence system has to have definite proof before they could say this. But uh, when right. people say they, they've got, uh, you know, uh, evidence, uh, it may not reach a standard of an intelligence estimate. You may not be able to say definitively with U.S. government authority, but just think about it. You look at those statements, look at the reference to nuclear facilities. It, it, it very briefly, General, does that include the, deliver, the ability to deliver that weapon or not, in your That's mind? Question. That's the question. But think of it from the Israeli perspective. Iran comes back again with a barrage of missiles. There's 150 missiles again. Now, do you know for sure that not one of them has a nuclear warhead? What if one of them does? What if two of them do? Hmm. How can you deal with that then? And this is why... You know, we're really at a tough point in in the region. All right. We got to leave it there. General Wesley Clark, again, great to hear from you and speak with you as always, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will tell you something interesting from my perch here, listening to that and watching that, both Mick and Max, two former members of Congress, when the general said that, they both went, whoop, in the back of their in the back of their seat. Um, Very fascinating to hear that from the general. All right. Still much more to come here on the hill, including Hot Mike with Mick. You're going to make everybody jump out of We're their seat? What, what are you going to do? It's freezing cold it in here. So we you need sound a hot, like, you sound like Trump. He was about. complaining about the courtroom being cold. You're complaining about the studio well, being cold. We're going to heat it up in the next segment. Uh, what, are, what are you talking about coming up? Uh, talking about uh, Adolf Hitler. What else is there when it comes to Donald Trump? Um, and we're going to talk about... Uh, I've already forgotten. You're, <laughs> he's, he's not joking on that front. Hot Mike with Mick. On the other side of the break, you're watching The Hill. His karate lessons might not turn him into a black belt. And even after band camp, he might not be the greatest musician. 
But with the 3% annual percentage yield you can earn on a PenFed premium online savings account, your goal of supporting his dreams... Thanks for everything, Mom and Dad. ...will always be worth it. Apply today at PenFed.org slash savings. Federally insured by NCUA. $5 minimum to open account. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed. PenFed's got great rates for everyone. With Spring Black Friday savings at The Home Depot, you can give your lawn or garden beds a pop of color and protection. Right now, get a special buy on Scott's Earth Grow Mulch, five bags for just $10. Help your soil retain moisture longer with color that lasts up to 12 months. Shop Spring Black Friday savings for a special buy on Scott's Earth Grow Mulch, five bags for just $10 at The Home Depot. How doers get more done. Mom. Mommy. Mom. This Mother's Day, celebrate the working moms. You're a real woman of the 80s. The stay-at-home moms. So, Mom, what's for dinner? And every mom in between. That is terrific. Celebrate the day with the mom who does it all, Elise Keaton, with a full day of family ties. Oh, it'll be nice. Mother's Day at the Keatons. All day, May 12th on Antenna TV. Go to AntennaTV.tv to check your local listings. In 1956, Mad Magazine had Alfred E. Newman run for president. The cartoon character's campaign slogan was, What, me worry? It was a reference to America in the Cold War. Today, the bomb is bigger than ever, and so is worry. Dr. Gary Probst here with a thought about you and the news in just a moment. David was in big trouble with the IRS. At first, I didn't owe that much, but after this year, it was out of control. Then David called Get a Tax Lawyer. Right away, they were like, oh yeah, looks like you're qualified to say it's... Get a Tax Lawyer went to work. (laughs) Should have called way sooner. Get a Tax Lawyer has helped thousands like David fight the IRS and get a fresh start. Call 800-783-0798. That's 800-783-0798. I spent quite a few years in television news as an investigative reporter, but for the past few decades I've watched a change from serious journalism to excessive use of breaking news, alerts, going live for no reason, tons of hype, all to keep you on edge and keep you watching. Now there are new networks that are trying to reverse that trend, but anxiety from news is very high. Today we're flooded with spin and slant, social media, unverified sources, information all around us, and we worry about What's next? Don't let the media cause that. We're all still here. Reconsider what really impacts your life. Breaking news, we're all just fine. You're listening to The Hill on News Nation. To find News Nation on your screen, go to joinnn.com. Snakes, zombies, sharks, heights, speaking in public. The list of fears is endless. But while you're clutching your blanket in the dark, wondering if that sound in the hall was actually a footstep, the real danger is in your hand when you're behind the wheel. And while you might think a great white shark is scary, what's really terrifying and even deadly is distracted driving. Eyes forward. Don't drive distracted. Brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. More than 6 million kids in the U.S. have ADHD, and many aren't getting the support they need. At understood.org, we know that parents want to help, especially when their child has questions like, Why am I always falling behind? Why do I feel so alone? We provide parents with the resources they need to help kids with ADHD thrive. Your child wants to thrive. Be the reason they do. Visit understood.org slash the reason to get started. Life is full of moments, including difficult and disruptive ones like a cancer diagnosis which is why the groundbreaking work of Stand Up to Cancer is so vital. They bring together top minds from different fields to find new and better treatments so patients can thrive. Please join Stand Up to Cancer and Myrtle Beach to help families get back to where they belong, making new memories for years to come. Go to StandUpToCancer.org to see how you can join the mission. All right, so once Mulvaney throws his Uber Eats order in, it'll be time for Hot Mike with Mick. You didn't have to give that away, bro. Uh, Mick, I'm President Trump has long been known for the colorful nicknames he gives his opponents. Now there is, though, reportedly uh, in the White House, uh, some aides there are, this is according to the reporting of Politico, that some folks within the White House are calling, quote-unquote, Hitler 
pig. Yeah, this is this has got to stop. And I, I can't look at my Democrat friends and do this at the same time. But no, I, I do you want can to talk discuss this. This has got to stop. It, it, it just does. And I know people say, well, it's it's unique to Donald Trump. It's because of January 6. It's not. The Democrats have referred in one way or the other to uh, to Donald to since Richard Nixon, every Republican candidate for president, to Hitler. That includes, by the way, Mitt Romney. This absolutely has to stop. They know who these people are. These are not anonymous tweets. They know they're inside the White House. They should fire the people, and the White House should come out and say this is wrong. Because here's my here's my concern: mm -hmm. either you believe it or you don't. Okay, if you believe it and you control the House of Representatives, are you going to certify the election? If you don't believe it, why are you ripping the country apart using some of the most incendiary terms that you possibly can? Trump campaign says Joe Biden talks a lot about decency, but he and his staff don't have a decent bone in their bodies. These ridiculous and gross comments reflect the failure and dishonesty of the entire Biden I, I remember the Michelle Obama line about, you know, when they, they go, go low, low, when you go, go high. high. Yeah. No, they don't. Yeah. And this, it just, it should stop. And the white, listen, you're never going to stop it entirely, but this White House is in a position to go in and say, these young people, and they were young people, they were not senior people, that's not acceptable behavior, and you're Take gone. Take any exception to what he says? Absolutely. It should, it should come to an end immediately. And the persons who wrote these tweets and, and shared these comments should sure. be disciplined immediately. Oh. Um, this is There's no place for this kind of discourse or conversation or um, use of that language or name um, in, in our democracy, and especially by folks who should really know better. Okay. Really? Donald oh, Trump. Ma by Max, the... Max looks like he disagrees. Do you disagree with this? Yeah, come on. We're so soft. I mean, first of all, the, the Democrats are obviously worse at nicknames than Donald <laughs> Trump, which is an issue. But you can't criticize this and stand in this, you know, sanctimonious posture and then just be totally silent when, Don when Donald Trump doesn't just single out one individual, but singles out an entire class of people and establishes them as bloodthirsty animals. Our political rhetoric has, in a sense, gone in a bad direction. But the deeper problem is not the language that people are using. It is the clash of two separate policies, one of which puts the country in a better place and the other of which puts us in a much worse place. And that's what the conversation is. And you can have a clash of policies without using terminology. Amen. Leave, leave, leave it there for a second. So, that's, so that's right. not just Trump, by the way, finding a new way to raise <laughs> campaign funds. It's a bit unusual. His campaign has sent a letter to down-ballot campaigns demanding at least 5% of all all money raised from <laughs> advertising that features the president's name, image, and likeness. NIL, I thought this was just a college I, thing. I got to tell you, I actually like this one, and there's a Why? specific reason for it. We had a huge problem when we were in the White House with people using his name and his image and his likeness, if you want to use that terminology, without permission. We actually had a race. I can't remember where it was back in 2019. I was in the midterms in 2018. I think there were four or five people running in a Republican primary, everybody using his face and his name, trying to give the impression that he had given them the endorsement. And that's a real problem when you're is, trying to control is the brand. Pay, is pay for endorsements next? Charging for endorsements? Uh, I don't, you want, I, I, like, I, if you're going to do this, is that the next step or no? Uh, let's see how this one works. Let's see if it stops the problem. Um, okay. I think, it I think the next step will. is just a GoFundMe. <laughs> <laughs> just a GoFundMe page. It seems to be the next Isn't step. there some the argument, I mean, for, like, fair use? When you're the president or the former president, <laughs> Your likeness is everywhere. And so once you become a public figure, your expectation should be different. But I think I think generally that's correct. I've seen this a dozen times with different fundraising, yeah. with all these packs coming out. And they'll use my picture or Max's picture to give the impression that we're supporting that pack. And we'll write them and ask them to please stop. Mm. And right. I'm pretty sure they have to do that. By the way, show the seal. Show the seal real quick. You'll because be uh, what the Trump campaign <laughs> is trying to do is if you use, if you're going to pay in the 5%, you get the seal. There you uh, there's, go. there's the uh, prize. All right. Um, all right, Mick. Now the best like story. You get a commitment best story. Story. The best story. <laughs> you know, looks like Mick's home state of South Carolina may be the place to be. Look at this article in the New York Times. Place to be if you're a Republican, maybe. Uh, sick of your blue state? These real estate agents have just the place for you. It notes how South Carolina is a place where conservatives are eager to move. I wasn't trying to dig your home oh, state there, yes, or Republicans. No, I wasn't. Uh, what's going on in South Carolina? Uh, really, really good things. And... Uh... People, you read the article and it, it sounds like home, which is people come and visit 
and they just like it. People are nice to them. The weather is good. Um, if you want to go to church, no one makes fun of you. If you want to vote for Donald Trump, nobody thinks you're a bad person. Um, people have voted with their feet in this country for more than 200 years. So it's not surprising to see this. Uh, Texas got expensive. Florida got expensive. South Carolina still fairly reasonable. Um, and it's a fun place and a good place to live. I just hope when these folks move from the blue states that they leave their politics behind. <laughs> so in California, my South Carolina. Huh? Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. Boy, it's There's a, actually- what a boring place to go. Now we have to fight. I have got to hit him. I have to hit him now. It's so boring. The restaurant's closed. Try getting a reservation after 7.15. Beautiful place. Beautiful place. You want to take on the New Yorker here? Friendly faces. I told you. It's your first day on the show. I told you. He's the troublemaker. I mean. All right. By the way, President Biden wrapped up his three-day swing in Pennsylvania with an endorsement from one of the most prominent families in all of Democratic politics. We want to make crystal clear our feeling that the best way forward for America is to reelect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to four more years. I don't want to become emotional, but what an incredible honor to have the support of the Kennedy family. Not in attendance, of course, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who himself is running as an independent in November. Now, while he didn't get his siblings' endorsement, and and that got all the headlines today. I want to say not all, but maybe most, right? The family comes out for Biden. It's it's not a good look. Nobody wants to see that, right? But I thought there might have been a bigger story, and tell me if I'm wrong, that RFK Jr. got ballot access in the state of Michigan. And if Joe Biden wants to win re-election, you both are saying yes, he's got to win the state of Michigan. So what does it mean that now RFK Jr. is mixing it up in maybe the most important state in the election? I mean, I think the Democrats have always seen him as the biggest threat to Biden's re-election promises or hopes. And so, of course, they're going to be upset that he's in Michigan. I mean, this shouldn't be a surprise. They've been hanging out with the Bidens very cozy, St. Patrick's Day pictures, vacationing together. I mean, the Kennedys are all about making sure they distance themselves and coming out vocally. So, of course, there's no headlines on. I'm not surprised at all. What I do think is so interesting is how RFK Jr. responded is precisely why the juxtaposition between how he responded and how Biden's, all of that response would have been, is precisely why Americans are so tired of the discourse, except for Max. Everyone hates how divisive everything is right now. So he responds the, with kindness. Yeah, we can put the, the statement up Civility. on the screen. He wasn't yeah. hostile to his family no. at all. He sort took of, the high road. He, he did took the, the Michelle Obama. To put it. Okay, so yeah. obvious. What, um, what concerns you more that as Democrats, that he, that Biden, uh, well, let me ask, l- let me let me put it this way. Michigan, RFK Jr. on the ballot. Is that the real story today? Sure, absolutely. I mean, right now in the polling, we're seeing that Kennedy specifically is polling somewhat equally from both the Trump camp and the Biden camp. But what we're also seeing is that in an absence of any third party candidate, Joe Biden is doing better than Donald Trump would under the same circumstances. So I I wouldn't be surprised if you start to see negative messaging towards RFK. Um, That's happening already. No, no, I mean like real money behind it um, on TV. We're not seeing anything on TV in these swing states yet. Um, And and they'll do and they should do whatever's necessary to, to win this thing. RFK Jr. on the ballot in Michigan. Well, I agree here. I think that, you know, the Biden camp can't lose sight of RFK as someone who is pulling support steadily. Um, and it could be a challenge for Democrats, especially when you think about a state like Michigan with really narrow margin of victory. Um, Democrats have to make sure that they're continuing to solidify their base, but also keeping keeping their eye on RFK and his supporters. And if they need to continue to kind of galvanize that support and bring them back home, so be it. I think that's got to be a part of their strategy. Give you the last word here, Mick. Uh, Michigan's a big story. It is. Uh, but Max is right. The question is not what uh, not what Kennedy is pulling. It doesn't make a difference if he's pulling 2% or 22%. It makes a difference who he's pulling mm-hmm. from. If he's pulling 2% and it's all from Joe Biden, that's a real problem. For right. Him. Okay. All right. Still to come here from the Hill. Why did this toilet in San Francisco cost $300,000? Believe it or not, that actually could have been much, much worse. And why is the National Park Service... Cracking down on America's pastime. Would you take a look at this logo right here? Show it on the screen. Do you have any issue with that? Part of the government does. 
We'll explain when The Hill on News Nation returns. Tonight, only on News Nation, Brian Enton with a world exclusive on where the two Kansas moms met their tragic fate. This is where they discovered the missing mom's bodies. A never before seen look at the scene of the crime. Vanfield tonight, only on News Nation. A lower level minor league baseball team in Montana for trademark infringement. Now, this is according to a report in the Washington Times. NPS claims Montana's Glacier Range Riders Arrowhead logo, you can see it there on the right, is far too similar to theirs. And they even took that legal fight to Congress. Yesterday, after a, a House appropriations hearing, the Montana Republican Congressman Ryan Zinke called out the mess in a press release, stating, quote, the Interior Department. Suing a family-owned minor league baseball team is the worst case of federal overreach and predatory litigation by the government I have ever seen. Keep in mind, that is the former Secretary of the Interior. Yep. So he knows right. what he's talking about. This is, this Max and I were talking about this off the air. This is, it's, it's, listen, it's not going to change an election, but this is just going to be another example that people point to of a government that's out of mm. touch with ordinary people. It's a family-owned business. Poor by the way, we, we, put that, we put that graphic up against yeah, show, a, a show stadium, it again. If a you stadium want. of, 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 of a, the backdrop of a stadium, right? That's not where these folks play. The stadium probably holds 2,000 <laughs> yeah, people. I think it's the Pioneer, Pioneer League, League, right? Yeah, they'd be is... lucky if it holds 2,000. This is a small business in the middle of nowhere in Montana, and the federal government is going after them. This is, these are the folks who love Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what I do find interesting here is this in the backdrop of the Senate race. So is this an opportunity in Montana, which is a tough thing for the Democrats right now, is this an opportunity for the incumbent okay. Democrat to hit at the, the Biden administration? Go back. That's a good point. Yeah, mm, that's that's interesting. interesting. All right. I didn't think of that. Uh, meantime. See, it's, Max comes up with stuff You're so now. smart. Yeah. Look at that. Yeah. Once going in a while, the whole, just, the whole show. Just, <laughs> I mean, bad South Carolina. I mean, yeah, just, be, you, did, you did bad mouth bad, his you, home you heard, state, so. You, you bring me on <laughs> here to words. talk the truth. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that place sucks. Oh, <laughs> come on, Max. Oh, come on. Why are you doing that about South Carolina? Since the guy from New York, people, please allow that to sit. All right. Well, here's Mick's turn, because we're about to talk about California. The small public bathroom causing a debate around wasteful spending. The city of San Francisco finally opened a public restroom that was originally expected to cost $1.7 million to install. The actual cost still breaking the bank just around $300,000. You see the outside bathroom. Oh, my uh, gosh. I don't know if we should have the picture. That is it right there. This is your home state. I'm so sorry. I'm always the one having to, like, stand up and talk, you know, trash about my own house. Look. You need a $300,000 toilet to put up with the crap we put up with in California. <laughs> and that's all I'll so, say. So th- th- this was originally expected to cost $1.7 million. They were able to bring it down wow. to, to, wow. to, to $300,000. Not bad? I'm impressed that they brought it down to, to $300,000. <laughs> for a bathroom for that? We, we, we've seen bathrooms in New York City that have cost three, four it's million. million. not even a mirror so, in there. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> look, look, it... it I, I'm not an expert on bathrooms. Is it a toto? Is, is it heated? Does it talk it, to you? It is distinctly progress when it comes to this one issue, which has been the New York Post must run a headline on bathroom costs at least once a year. And usually it's three, four million dollars. New York Post would not run a headline about a three. See, in South Carolina, lies the that totally costs about 50 grand. <laughs> so. Yeah, there lies the difference between the Republicans and the Democrat who thinks we're getting a deal. <laughs> <laughs> Meantime, uh, did you know that Bring Someone's Your Kid to Work money. Day <laughs> is seven days money, away? You know? A week from now, seven days away, Bring Your Kid to Work Day. One lawmaker is celebrating it a bit early. The Republican congressman from New York, uh, from North Carolina, rather, Patrick McHenry, brought his son, would you look at that, uh, brought his son Perry to mark up so duties cute. for the Financial oh, Services Committee. Adorable. He sat there, look at Perry, and look it's at the congressman, so too. Uh, acted, acted as good as you could expect a three-year-old to act. In yeah. I have year. no idea how that young McHenry kid could see over the podium, and I don't know how the baby did it either. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I shared a cubicle with Patrick McHenry before he was a congressman in the Bush campaign in Austin, Texas. And it's so crazy to see. You know, you just remember people at that that one moment in time, 1999, 2000. Yeah. 
to see them be, you know, such incredible, do incredible things. And I'm really sad to see him leave. Patrick McHenry, yeah. Patrick McHenry is not the story here. It's the three-year-old. Look at the composure yeah, of that kid. Father. If he had gotten him a little matching bow tie. Yeah. So cute. Did you two ever think about doing that? You missed a moment. There's a cell phone that you missed can't see. With. Right, right there with yeah, Netflix yeah, or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Did yeah. you ever? You, uh, was your iPad. your kid was what one or two when you were a member of Congress? Uh, you ever think about doing that? Not, not even. No, so. not even. Did you ever think about doing that? No. And by the way, I know when you explain humor, you're losing. But McHenry's like four foot eleven. Yeah. So that, yeah, yeah, yeah. What I was a lot funnier. Than I thought it was funny. That was a good one. By the way, though. Really, the, what's inexplicable here is that man is not running for re-election, and nonetheless, nonetheless, still involving his child in public politics. That's impressive. Good on him. Good that's, on that's, him. That's, that is right. impressive. Still to come here <laughs> from the Hill, NPR employees are now fighting back after being accused of liberal bias by a former editor. Some staff members have written a letter to their new CEO. What are they asking for? Leland Vitter joins us on the other side of the break. Stay with us. All right, welcome back here to The Hill on News Nation. Some NPR employees are now demanding answers from NPR's CEO regarding an essay that claimed the news outlet has a liberal bias. Yuri Berliner, a 25-year veteran of NPR, went public in the recent days with what he claims is the network's liberal bias. He resigned yesterday after being suspended by NPR. News Nation obtained a copy of a letter from NPR staff members asking for clarification of the network's direction and for what they claim are the factual inaccuracies in Berliner's original piece. Leland Vitter, host of On Balance, come on in. Um, I just what is what is the first step in the twelve step process? Admitting you have a problem, right? <laughs> uh, look, what NPR's problem was is not that they got exposed for having a bias; it was that they got exposed for excluding other opinions, mm-hmm. right? Which is true bias, right? It's not even giving fairness or a fair shake 